Hey guys, and welcome to another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. I'm Josh Horowitz. Whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening or watching us on Spotify, thanks as always for checking out what I do here, which is talk to some of our most iconic actors, filmmakers, comedians, authors, um, and certainly our guest this week, guys. It's a doozy. Russell Crowe is the guest on Happy, Sad, Confused. That's coming up for you guys. 45 minutes with... The legend that is Russell Crowe, a man who has been entertaining me uh, and millions for decades. He's an icon. So um, more to come on that in a second. But I just want to remind you guys, remember to review, rate, subscribe, hit the button, hit the like, do the thing, spread the good word of happy, sad, confused. Um, Why keep it to yourself, guys? This channel, this podcast is for everybody. I want to tell you guys that uh, we have a upcoming event in New York City, and virtually, if you can't be in New York for us, on May 15th, John Cena is going to be my live guest on Happy, Sad, Confused. He was on not so long ago for Peacemaker. Now he's on for Fast 10, Fast X. What do we call it? I'm going to ask John Cena what we call this movie. Uh, It's going to be an awesome night. May 15th at the 92nd Street Y in New York City. I'll put the information in the show notes so that you can't miss it. Um, I think tickets are going to go fast on this one. And if you can't be there in person, join us virtually live. It's going to be a special one. Um, Other things to mention, I don't know, guys, there's a lot going on. Dungeons and Dragons is out. Check out my interviews with Chris Pine for Comedy Central. That was a blast. That was insane. Uh, Reggae Jean Page for MTV. Check that on MTV News' socials. Uh, Yeah, it's busy, but good. All is well. We're getting going, guys. Summer, summer movies are coming, like Fast 10, Mission Impossible, a lot of big ones coming at you. Um, but we're, we're, let's talk about the main event today. So Russell Crowe is my guest on Happy, Sad, Confused. Um, this, was a, this was a big one. I mean, I grew up uh, on Russell Crowe movies like we all did, right? Um, Gladiator, L.A. Confidential, I mean, A Beautiful Mind. The man, I think, was nominated for Best Actor three years in a row. The Insider. Uh, he's worked with some of the greats, whether it's Michael Mann or Ridley Scott or Ron Howard. Um, and he is thoughtful, opinionated, charismatic, everything you want in a guest. Um when this one came around, I was so excited. He is promoting the new film, The Pope's Exorcist, uh, in which he plays the title character. It's a big old uh, crazy, fun horror movie based on a true story-ish. You know, one of those like exorcism movies where you're like, how real is this? I don't know. But it's a fun one. He's clearly relishing the role. Uh, and it could be his um, Robert Langdon. It could be a character he returns to. He clearly uh, had a blast doing it. So... Um, We talk about that film, but of course, you don't have Russell Crowe on if you're not going to talk about his entire career. And we cover a lot in this, guys. There's a lot of Gladiator stuff. There's a lot of... We talk about the superhero stuff in recent years, whether it's Man of Steel and Thor. Uh, We touch on um, the Kraven movie that he's going to be in, um, the the roles that he wanted to do, sequels that came and went that didn't happen. and yeah, this this is a guy that, like, he's not an actor that just shows up on set. He's a collaborator. He has ideas. And he talks openly about what he likes in a set and how he kind of came to Hollywood and found his way. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. It's a rare chat, I should say, too. I mean, Russell, he does interviews, but I can't, I couldn't find another long-form podcast that he's done. So enjoy this. This is a true rare opportunity, a deep dive with one of the icons of cinema the last 25, 30 years. Uh, Here it is for your ears, for your eyes, however you're consuming this. Enjoy my chat with the one and only Russell Crowe. I must be doing something right because Russell Crowe is in my Zoom box on my screen. Uh, Welcome to the podcast, sir. You've been on the list a while. Thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate it, man. Cheers. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. As you can tell, I'm excited. My dog is very excited. As you can see here, Lucy is uh, a big fan. Lucy, hello, puppy. She's playing it cool. No reaction. She's playing it cool around you. <laughs> um, congratulations, man, uh, on the film. Well, first of all, I should say um, you're in the future. Uh, you're in Australia. Are things yeah. is everything cleared up over there? Did we figure it all out? Because things are still fucked no, up a day no, a day it's, behind it's over still, here. It's still the same morass of of confusion. But oh, no. uh, uh, the, the the future looks bright. I mean, it's it's a very beautiful sunny day here today. I'm, I hope that uh, you get that too tomorrow. 
Oh, excellent. Okay. That's something I, I'll take anything I can get at this point. Um, congrats on the film, The Pope's Exorcist. Uh, it really works. This one totally works. And here's here's my theory on why it works. And, it, and I can I can connect it to some of some other work of yours, if you'll indulge me. It embraces what it is. It is a good version of what this should be, of what you want out of an exorcism film, of a scary film. And I think back to films you've done, whether it's Gladiator or L.A. Confidential or Cinderella Man. And those are movies that are they don't arch an eyebrow at what they are doing. They're just being the best version of that kind of movie. Am I am I fishing? Am I where am where am I at? What do you think? Well, I, you know, look, I, I'm I'm glad you had a good experience with it. You know, I, I think that there's there's you know with with horror films, it it can be so easy to overcook your audience. You know, uh, and give them so much stuff that they go, ah, it's too much or whatever. You know, what we were trying to do here is, you know, particularly once I started reading the true history of the of the man, Father of Morth, you know, is try and balance the horror stuff with a little bit of humor, but also bring into it, you know, I mean, I'm only talking about, you know, scratching the surface here, like little bits of Da Vinci Code or even yeah. little bits of Raiders of the Lost Ark or, you know, and, and as one uh, guy I was talking to the other day said, so this is an exorcism buddy movie? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that no. has elements of, of, of all that stuff. And when the laughs hit, they hit an audience really hard, you know? Yeah. So uh, You do undercut some, some moments in a, in a wonderful way after like a truly dramatic, horrific moment. There is that kind of like sigh of like, can you believe that just happened? Jesus. Maybe Jesus well, is the wrong thing to yeah, say. Yeah, there's, there's, there's so much there's so much space to, you know, put a line flat on the table, which give, gets a good response. You know, um, yeah, I you know I looked into this character and I just really enjoyed. No, I'm talking about the real man, you know, right? The, the real man, what he'd done in his life, and I just thought he was absolutely uh, fascinating, you know, and that idea of you know, one of, of keeping him as an Italian and letting him be as an, as Italian as possible, you know, but also bringing what is a very well documented and quite famous irreverent sense of humor to the table as well, you know? Well, I was going to say, yeah, like, is, is the real man, like how much of this are Russell touches or in the script or how much is it the real man? Like the, the sunglasses, the humor, sneaking a little whiskey, a Vespa, like these are little... Well, these, little, these are little things, by the way. It's a lambretta. You must understand. Oh, sorry, it's a lambretta, no Vespa. But see, these are little things, and some of them are documented, and some of them are secrets. And some of his friends and colleagues didn't want to necessarily talk about how he might smoke a cigarette every now and then, or he might do this or that. You know, things that are sort of outside what we would understand in normal priestly realm to be. You know, but it was quite clear in the things that I could read that there was this uh, irreverence to authority, you know? Right. He understood the hierarchy, obviously, of the church, but he still sort of felt that everybody in that organization should be bound by uh, truth and, and, and be, you know, bound by the spirit of what they do, you know, not just the black and white of it, you know? So, um, you know, he said some outrageous things over time man my favorite quote of his is when he said you should not do yoga <laughs> for yoga requires you to put yourself at the center of the universe surely this is a place god should occupy so just do stretching <laughs> Can you record just like um, daily affirmations for me in this voice? I just, uh, I, I you, Josh, it's going to be a very good day. You're going you... to have a lovely time. Or Josh, the new, the new voice of the to feed Lucy. <laughs> the new voice of the New York subway system, perhaps. Next yes. stop, <laughs> next stop is going to be Brooklyn. You're going to love it, everybody. <laughs> So, okay, if you, you, this is a, a filmmaker you haven't worked with before. You've obviously repeated with a lot of filmmakers over the years. Is there like a, a, a spiel, a kind of like a, a groundwork you like to lay where you're working with somebody for the first time? Like, this is the way I work. I want to connect with you and meet you in common ground. Like, this works for me. Let's let's f find out where we can 
connect? Like what, what's the opening kind of conversation to connect with well, a filmmaker? It, it, it usually centers around sort of authorship, you know, <laughs> in that um, it's all well and good what you have on the page now. That's going to change. Um, I've, I've spent, you know, if, if I'm spending weeks looking into something on your behalf, you know, and I, un I, I uncover nuggets of gold and you – uh, decide that, uh, you know, those nuggets of gold are not worthy enough for your movie or, or whatever, um, then it's sort of problematic. It's like you're, you're sort of cutting me short of, of what I'd actually do, you know. Um, but Julius Avery, you know, is a young Australian. Obviously, um, um, you know, because of that, he's probably seen a lot of the stuff I've done and, and grown up with the stuff I've done, you know. So he was well aware of that level of authorship, you know, and that's every single movie I've ever done. It's very, very rare that I've ever been on a set and gone, oh, I'm sticking to every single word that's on this page, you know. But yeah. I also do um, have the capacity to recognize when something's perfect, you know, and it doesn't need <laughs> any adjustment. So don't worry about that, you know. But, um, you know, quite often, you know, by the time a script has gone through the process, you know, it might be in one shape when the first writer has a go at it, and then gets in, you know, they bring in someone to rewrite and then it gets sort of reshaped over in another direction. And, then, uh, and, and what the people that are looking for is maybe a series of things that they want to see in a line, you know, they want to see all their ducks in a row. But what they forget is that this medium works on many different levels. And sometimes that process of script revision dries everything out. There's no juice left, you know? Right. There's nothing because it's no one person's voice. It's just like diluted 18, that's, a that's committee right. of 18, yeah. That's right. So, you know, what I try often to do is actually, you know, in that sort of thing, look at the first ever draft and go, okay, where was he, where, you know, where was he actually going in the first place? But, you know, sometimes too, though, you, you, you've just got to take, things um, into your own hands and say, you know what, this needs to be significantly more interesting for a theatrical audience to give a shit. So um, <laughs> let's be real. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Yes, that's right. Let's, <laughs> let's go forward on that basis. We are not here to bore the piss out of people in the theater. We are here to entertain them. That's our job. It says that on the door, right? Off we go. <laughs> um, you know, but a lot of the things I say to young directors are just practical things, you know, I'll yeah. work uh, as hard as you require me to for, you know, the length of any day. Uh, but from the moment I leave, you know, uh, from the moment I arrive at my place of, of abode, it'll, it'll be 12 hours before I come back out that door again, you know? And and I think I've sort of done enough films and the right to have that sort of uh, protected turnaround because it's that time off the set where I've got to think and prep for the, the next few sure. days. So, you know, you, you, you don't want to get into a place that... Um, I was kind of forced into a, into a few films when I was a young fellow where you're in such a place of exhaustion. You're sort of missing opportunities. You know, you're missing opportunities and, and you're missing uh, connecting certain dots and what have you. And so for me, it's like, okay, whatever the job's going to take, but, you know, that turnaround. And, and I'll usually say this line. <laughs> I'll usually say, and this will be to the director and to the first assistant, um, I um, don't bother coming to me and asking me to break my turnaround because I don't break my turnaround even for God. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's funny. It might come across as intimidating, but <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. It establishes but, you know, it's, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good up front to establish that. You know, I, yeah. I very much know I'm on a, a film set and I'm working on behalf of that director. I'm working trying to bring that guy the vision that he has. But sometimes, you know, particularly with younger guys, they actually don't know what scaffolding is required to get to that thing that they're seeing in their head. You yes. Know? And, and quite often on sets these days, man, and, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's a very regular occurrence. You know, I was very lucky when I was a young actor. I got to work with people significantly older than me, you know, the, you know, Ridley Scott and Michael Mann and, yeah. Ron Howard and Peter Weir and, and so, you know, George Ogilvy is a very long list, you know, and each and every one of those great directors I've ever worked with, you can be absolutely assured I've taken a massive amount of information away with me that I've stored in the back of my head, you know, so there isn't very often a, a you know, in fact, I, I fail to remember one if I, if I even thought about it for a while, um, where I get on a, in a situation 
on a set where a young director has painted him or herself into a corner, there it's not very often, or if at all, that I can't give them the steps that they got to take to get out of that corner and get the day done. You know. Well, and what you could probably say to them, like those filmmakers you rattled off, like all of them, correct me if I'm wrong, they all come with a, a plan. I mean, there's no one more meticulous than Michael Mann, and yeah. yet he is a collaborative filmmaker. He wants Absolutely. to go, right? And so like, if yeah. Michael Mann is willing to collaborate, you 25 year old, don't pretend you have all the answers because you don't. Michael Mann doesn't. <laughs> Well, yeah, but see, Michael does absolutely have a plan. Michael will have a file for every scene, right? Right. So if you have five or six scenes you're doing on a particular day, he has a separate file for each scene. And, you know, he'll open that file. And at first I was expecting, oh, there's some sort of like absolutely amazing thing he's going to come out with, bring out from the file. But it might be a color swatch. Right. You know, uh, of, of something. It might be, you know, right. something tactile. You know, there might be um, a song lyrics. There might, they're just things that as can spark considering some, that scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then something comes up and he sticks it in that file. And then he brings that file out on the day. And you both kind of look at what's in the magic file and see what, what might help. But, you know, absolutely, Michael, um, you know, I, I mean, you know, Michael's not just going to take your idea for the sake of taking your idea. Michael's going to require you to debate this idea. Yes. Michael's going to require you to actually prove via empirical evidence or passion that you uh, have to adjust his trajectory, you know? Yeah. Um, and, but there's, you know, even though he's tough, right, and he's like sure like all great leaders are, you don't have to be right, you only have to be certain, <laughs> but he's still available to a better idea, you know, and that is uh, what makes him him great, you know. And look, Ridley is, is the same, you sure. know. I, I, I went to Ridley and, and I said, look, I just feel like I want something original that Maximus says when he's like greeting, you know, one of his soldiers. It's, it's not like, it's not something that he would use with somebody from the GP, you know. But when he's met one of his officers or one of his soldiers, somebody that, that he's been in the trenches with, you know, he has this particular thing and it's kind of like original sort of thing that he says with, with, with his men. And uh, I can make that over time have an emotional uh, quotient. And Ridley's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like, look, you know, so like I'm talking about like maybe a Latin phrase, you know, because um, I went to a school and the, the phrase of my school was uh, veritate etute, you know? And he's smoking the cigar and he's like, and what does that mean, you know? And I said, well, it's truth and virtue. And he goes, mm -hmm. you know? I said, but that's not the idea. <laughs> the idea would be to say, you know, uh, forza aonorum, you know? And really goes, what the fuck does that mean, you know? I said, well, it actually means strength and honor. And he goes, oh, say that. Now we're onto something. That's the character. Yeah, well, see, that's the thing. Yeah. It's like people, yeah. you know, yeah. people don't understand that collaboration doesn't come in a neat little bag. You know, no, it's the back it's and forth. It's the arguing and the... Two, there's two yeah. heads and they're yeah. both facing the same direction, both pushing towards the same thing, you know. And like even on the night, you know, when he wanted me to sit in the tent post-battle and, and ponder the universe... You know, and, and I said, well, why don't I have some kind of ritual? It's post battle and I'm, I'm being grateful, you know, to to the gods or whatever, you know, like a prayer, you know, and he goes, All right, okay, cool. So I'll light for that. I'll like, you know, puts all these spooky candles around and everything. And I was just mucking around with, you know, some stuff that the set decorators had put out. And I found that little figurine, that, you know, the the of the mother and the child, you know, yeah. So I'm, I move things around, you know, and he's like, what are you doing? You know, so I just, well, I just want to have the figurines in front of me, you know, because I'm talking to my wife and child, you know, and then at one take, I picked them up and kissed them. Right. And that just, it just set off a little thing in his head. And he's like tapping me on the shoulder at the end of that. And he goes, there's something in that man. There's something in that. And he just made sure that the art department knew where those figurines were. Right. And over time, you know, that's the first week of shooting. Over time, we start building this idea and then suddenly those figurines become, you yeah. know, that's the end of the film, you know? It's sort of like, and it's, uh, you know, but that's, like I say, it's, it, it's, it's just, you know, brains working together, facing the same direction, 
scratching right. at the same thing and seeing if you can't make improve it, you know? Yeah. I mean, the story of Gladiator could be its own podcast because I know infamously, I mean, how does that happen with, with a, a script that wasn't quite complete? But we'll, we'll save that for another uh, another day. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's there's always a catch, right? So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and actually using the service guys, it all makes sense. There's no catch. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They've cut the cost of retail stores and so they pass those savings on to you. Plus, they do this without sacrificing quality. The quality of Mint Mobile's wireless service is fantastic. I know this firsthand and from friends and family. So for anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. All plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Plus, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your phone number along with your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash HSC. That's mintmobile.com slash HSC. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash HSC. Since you foolishly have agreed to, to a decent amount of time with me, um, <laughs> I remember look, way back when, when, when I was a young lad, we were both young lads. I saw you first. I, I first saw you in the one-two punch of, I think it was Quick and the Dead and Virtuosity. And that was kind of your, your Hollywood like breaks, as it were. And then I went back and I saw Romper Stomper and I kind of, I, I saw the breadth of the work. But I guess, can you take me back to that time of like when you started to get those opportunities? And that must have been part of the goal, presumably, to break into Hollywood, as it were. And was it exciting, disillusioning? Like, what do you remember about that early time? Um, well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd very quickly sort of amassed a, um, um, a group of films in Australia that were doing work for me by themselves, traveling the world, you know. Um, right. The first one was a film called The Crossing, directed by George Ogilvie, who I mentioned before. And... Um, you know, that, that film never got any popularity in the mainstream or whatever, but from, you know, other filmmakers and, you know, people like that, they, they like George's work. They also like the work of the, the DP, Jeff Darling. Um, I was in, in a movie called Proof, which was about a, a blind photographer played by Hugo Weaving. And that film opened director's fortnight in Cannes. Oh, wow. So, you know? Yeah. And... Um, Romper Stomper that you mentioned, you know, so uh, there was a number of years in a row where I had, where I was represented by a film at, at the Cannes Film Festival, you know, and then I got to a point, I think it was like, it was only about seven lead roles in, right? And I, I'd also won, you know, by then I'd won a couple of Australian Oscars, you know, and then a, a script arrived and uh, gave me the opportunity to work with uh, an actress that I really wanted to work with. So I did it. But then the next script that came along was like a mirror of that script, you know? So I was looking at that and then I was looking at the careers of other Australian actors and I sort of, I just realized that even after like seven roles, from an Australian industry perspective, I was already in the place where they were happy and comfortable with what I'd done and uh, would just get you another role again. like yeah. that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So you can be the guy that rides the horse again, you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, I just thought this is going to drive me crazy. And I also thought that um, it was kind of like at the point of diminishing returns. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, you're out there. You, it's, if you, if you do this, you're actually forcing, you know, um, that you've actually peaked, you know? Right. And at that point in time, I was only, you know, in my twenties, in my late twenties, and it was like I've I've only just started doing this, you know. I'm right. I'm not I'm ready to sort of start re repeating myself. So, you know, the only option uh, left in front of me was to make movies in other places as well. Yeah, you know, S uh, scale the next peak. Start at the bottom, or start at the yeah, middle, and then go yeah, so scale I, that mountain I again. Went, yeah. I went to the Cannes Film Festival in 1991, and there was um, uh, there was an Australian actor that was there, and everybody was fating him and he's a guy that actually didn't didn't go on to have a big career but at the time 
a lot of support within the industry that he was going to be the, the next you know, big thing or whatever, you know? Right. Um, and, you know, I was there legitimately with the film that had opened Director's Fortnight, but none of those industry people were sort of <laughs> caring about me. They were focused on this other guy. But because he was sort of like by himself or whatever, he included me in a few of these lunches or whatever, and I, and I met some people, and I met this one particular lawyer, you know, and uh, I just took his card. I just got the vibe when I was at Ken. So many Americans, industry people, were coming up and they were talking to me, not about one role, but about multiple things that they've seen, they'd seen me in, you know. So I was just thinking, well, maybe I should go there, you know. And um, at the time, you're talking about the early 90s, it's not a, it's not a thing. You, know, you don't just go to Los Angeles and, you know, um, uh, create something you know you had people like sam neil or brian brown they were making international movies but they very definitely have walked into those films because something they had done had achieved a certain amount of success right and therefore it, they were sort of just kissed uh in, into those gigs you know um i guess mel know, I was the outlier perhaps right mel gibson was that? might be mel gibson might be considered the outlier maybe he's the one that kind of like yeah, but or Mel wasn't consider- really Australian, man. Yeah, he's Mel he grew up. He's as American have, as he is. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah he he, yeah. Didn't, he didn't have that thing of got walking into rooms and speaking in an accent where you know people couldn't understand. However, you got to remember the very first Mad Max, they dubbed his voice in America. No, I remember. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but but you know, because he had an American background and and his voice still had a American flavor to it, um, and of course, like just like with. Sam Neill with, with, you know, the, the Phil Noyce movie, uh, Dead Calm, I was trying to think of it, you know. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, and, you know, things like with uh, Brian Brown, he had something like Breaker Morant. They're, they're quite big independent successes, you know. And uh, Mad Max, I think, at the time was the largest box office for an independent film in the history of cinema, you know. Right. So they're slightly different situations, you know. Um, but I was, you know, um, and I was doing films that were getting a lot of respect and great reviews and stuff like that, but they were not movies that were breaking out at the box office, you know. In fact, Rumble yep. Stomper was banned in more countries than it showed in, I think, you know, <laughs> in reality, <laughs> you know. So I, I go into America off the back of just of just feeling that there was more going on than I'd, than I'd realized, you know. And I called that lawyer and uh, I said to him, listen, I want you to, why don't you arrange meetings with me with the top 10 agencies in uh, LA? And he sort of started like laughing, you know? Um, and he said, it just doesn't work that way. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, and I said, well, I've got a feeling that you don't know as much as these guys in the agencies, you know? So just indulge me. I'll pay you your hourly rate or whatever, you know? make a few phone calls, see if you can get any interest, you know. Literally a day later, he calls me back and he goes, well, you're, uh, you seem to be right. Every single agency has taken the opportunity to meet you. You've got top 10 and in some cases you've got, you know, uh, um, you know, one agency wants you to meet every one of its young agents and blah, 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 blah. And I said, cool, all right, well, let's make a date and I'll, I'll come in, right? So, you know, I, I go into Los Angeles with – the, you know, a singular thing in mind if I just find representation because that's the thing that always seemed to slow people down is that they, they might, you know, get have garnered some interest or whatever, but they didn't have a champion. They didn't have somebody working on their behalf, you know. So I did all of those meetings. I met all of those young agents and a couple of them stuck out to me, you know. Uh, one of them was a lady called Hilda Queeley and the mm. other one was another guy called George Freeman. Now, these two at the time, were both junior, junior agents, right? You know, those sort of agent where they had to have two other people within the same company, you know, a, a middle level agent and a senior agent agreeing to their decisions before they could do anything, you know what I mean? So it's odd though, that those two particular um, people went on to have massive careers and develop multiple Academy Award winners. And, you know, I mean, Hilda represents some of the greatest actresses in history and blah, blah, blah. So interesting that I met everybody and those were my top two, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, initially I signed with Hilda, but then I felt, you know, the first thing that came up, 
you know, it got taken away from me because the agency wanted to give that particular job to somebody else. I was like, oh, okay, right, this I'm in the wrong spot here. So um, over one weekend, I switched from, you know, uh, so Hilda represented me for a day. <laughs> I switched during the course of the weekend <laughs> and was with a different agent by the Monday. And the thing is, is, you know, that, that guy, George Freeman, I'm still represented by him today. Wow. Uh, I still work with him today, you know, and it's that consistency of our, of our collaboration. Everybody knows, you know, in town, they know how to find out if I'm available. They, you know, they, they haven't had to like track me down through agency no, switches the, or whatever. The so. mysterious Bill Murray number. They know to go to George. They go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's that, that thing of, of like you know when it, when he's left an agency, I've left that agency. You know, gotcha. Or when yeah, he yeah. Got fired from an agency, I went with him. You know, it's sort of like, uh, yeah. and we, you know, it's it's a great collaboration, man. It's been very very successful. You know, um, do, but do you, know, you re- back in the day? Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to set this the ground here because you asked me about what it was like. Yeah, you know, you're talking about a period of time, man. When I go into a meeting, and I would speak in my natural accent. And people would literally be sitting in front of me go, I'm sorry, I can't understand what you're saying. It's like, I just asked for coffee. You asked for a what? You know, and it was just like, it's very odd. You know, and you got producers coming up saying, hey, man, you know, don't whatever you do, talk in your natural accent. Just, you know, pick a place you're from in America and then just tell people you're from Kansas. And once you say that, they'll be happy or whatever, and then just get on with the meeting. But, But don't speak as an Australian. And in my, you know, pig headed young mind, I was like, if the director is so stupid that they, they don't, you know, they haven't looked at something I've done before they brought me in, right? right. Or that they, you know, it, it's like, I don't want to work with that person. I want to work with a person that can talk to me like, you know, I'm the normal person and then allow me to leap from me as me to me as the character, you know? Sure. Um, so it was, it was a, a very, uh, interesting time. And I did, you know, a few years there of, you know, I, I could see the people who'd moved to Los Angeles and what they were settling for. And, you know, I didn't want to do that. So I kind of manufactured this thing that I was so busy, I could only come in for a week or 10 days at a time, you know. And in fact, the reality was, it w- was true. I was, uh, I had lots of work to do, you know, but I did want to break into that market, you know. But I sort of had this idea that, if I only came in every now and then, yeah, the scarcity of bit, Russell. Oh wait, we gotta, we gotta yeah, grab it was him. A little bit more, it was a little bit more special, right? You know, yeah. And yeah. I'd arrive in my, um, I used to call myself the shoe salesman because you know I'd arrive in Los Angeles and I'd get uh, you know a rental car, a mobile phone, and a list of meetings, right? And uh, one of the first times I went in there, I had like seven meetings on the Monday, and in my agent's mind is like everybody in LA shifts meetings. So you go to a meeting, they say, sorry, such and such can't see you now, but we can see you now on Wednesday or whatever, you know? And the idea, he, he gave me like, you know, seven meetings. So I went out on the Monday, did them all, you know? And even if somebody said they couldn't see me right now, I said, I'll wait, you know? <laughs> so I got all the meetings done. I called and said, yeah, got all those done. He said, you, you did what? I said, all the meetings done. What am I doing tomorrow? You know? He goes, that was supposed to last you all week. <laughs> and I was like, no, it didn't. So, it was one of those funny things that when I was a young fellow, I got around and met everybody. Sure. You know, so as I started to work in America, you have this thing where these people who met you a couple of years before, you know, they start to feel connected to you. You know, so you start to have this wider, you know, community that is kind of willing your success because they met you when, you know. Sure. Um, now, of course, once you get to a sort of a peak point of that, um, it changes very rapidly because now everybody that you ever met wants you to do their project and you simply cannot do everything, you know, but it becomes that, you know, when you cross into that point with studios where if you say you want to do it, they will finance it, you know, then that becomes a really big thing for a lot of independent producers or whatever, you know, guarantee sort of that they can get their project over the line. So when you have to start saying no, to people who consider that they're part of your success, then, you know, things change. Is it just me or in this time of year, is everybody talking about making these giant changes to their lives as if we're all going to just change overnight into a different person? For me, it's not about the giant change. It's about the small stuff and the small stuff that can impact your day to day. And for me, that's where earbuds come in. That's where Raycon, our sponsor, comes into play because with Raycon, you're getting premium audio at the perfect 
price point so you can build great habits without breaking the bank. They give you everything you want, at least I want, in an earbud. They have crystal clear call quality and you need that. I need that. I don't want calls breaking up while I'm talking or running. They are water and sweat resistant because guys, I sweat when I run. They give you eight hours of playtime for everyday earbuds or 11 hours for the everyday speaker. So you're gonna get the maximum amount of time with your device without having to recharge it constantly. Plus they look great, they feel great, they sound great. They are everything you guys need and want in an earbud. Are you ready to buy something small with a big impact? Go to buyraycon.com slash HSC today to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash HSC to score 15% off. Buyraycon.com slash HSC. It's fascinating also when you get to that point in the career when you do have the luxury and for 99% of actors, they don't have the luxury of saying no. And and you, for, like, because you are in that rarefied air and have been for some time, as famous as the roles you've done are these supposed roles that you passed on. Hugh Jackman has been very kind in saying he kind of owes, uh, owes you a career because you you passed on Wolverine, correct? Yeah, but I also suggested him for it, too, you know, <laughs> because, because, look, they show me art and stuff like that. And I was like, it doesn't look like me, you know? It doesn't look like me, but I'll tell you who it looks like is it looks like Hugh Jackman, you know, and I did the same with Baz Luhrmann, you know, they were doing sort of like pictures and stuff for Australia. And I'm like, okay, but you're drawing, you know, these drawings don't make me think of me, you know, <laughs> that, that looks like Hugh Jackman, you know? So, um, yeah, I've, I've always been able to say no though, you know, even when I was a young fella, if, if there was something that was offered that, you know, I didn't think was going to, be a, of significance to me in, in terms of what I, you know, what I would be able to give to it, then I would just say no. And I think, I think that's why I still love my job, Josh. You know, I'm, I'm know a bunch of people my age in my job and they're kind of a little bit bitter and twisted about things and stuff like that, you know. Bitter, but, bitter people you know, in, it, in Hollywood? What? What are you talking about, if, Russell? If I decide to be on a job <laughs> and it requires me to wake up at four o'clock in the morning, when I wake up at four o'clock in the morning, I know why I'm there. Yeah. And I'm totally fine because I made that decision. And, you know, so whatever you have to go through on behalf of the character and stuff, I'm comfortable with, you know, to because I simply know why I'm here. You know, I've I've made the decision based on doing this character because it's it's got under my skin. You've um you've you've been in a few very notable comic book movies, if not Wolverine, in recent years. I, I spoke to you a few years back, and I, I'm going to reiterate what I said to you then. Um, the opening sequence in Man of Steel is one of the great mic drop great sequences for me. It's like, oh, Russell Crowe is riding a dragon. I am so in for whatever this is going to be. <laughs> Take me with you, Zack Snyder. Um, did I, I guess just tell me, like, did you respond to that immediately? And why the hell... Didn't we get more of it? I mean, I think if that were made today, there is a Jor-El spinoff. There is an HBO Max series. Was there ever any talk of anything more with that character or was it, was it always one and done? Yeah, but I, I think that, you know, those kind of conversations happen all the time. You know, once somebody has something like that going and, you know, how how else you can sort of make things out. I would have loved to have done a, like a Jor-El, um, you know, uh, story pre the superman story and and you know while him and uh the other character whose name i'm forgetting at the moment um you know when they were friends you know and and the build-up of the political oh, Zod, yeah and, yeah michael shannon oh my you, god you guys yeah, together shannon, yeah 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 so that would have been interesting but you know um it never eventuated so that doesn't that doesn't bother me at all um i found that script very heavy going i have to say you know they they did the big studio security thing with that, where they, uh, you know, they they flew somebody to Australia carrying the script, you know, on red carrying, paper. They're watching you, uh, the whole thing, yeah, on single, you know, um, a, a copy. But you know, I I kept having to stop and go back and read it, so I kept that poor poor person hanging around my house for about <laughs> six or seven hours that day because I had kept going back and reading, you know, pages again to understand where, where I was. And, uh, you know, to be completely honest, I, I'm not sure I fully understood it once I finished it either, you know. Um, <laughs> but what I did understand was what they wanted me to do, and which, which was play um, Superman's dad. 
and uh, uh, that was kind of for me personally. You know, it was kind of stepping into the shoes of one of my greatest heroes. Yeah, and, if it's good enough for Marlon Brando. Well, still, I, I was old <laughs> enough by then to actually accept something like that with a little sort of, uh, you know, uh, warmth or whatever, you know. So I, I did it for me. I did it for my own reasons. Uh, I yeah. did it in my – it was my way of, of honoring, um, you know, one of the greatest actors that's ever existed, you know. You seem to be having a blast in the last Thor movie. I, I met Brett Goldstein recently. Um, I hope we get to see more – of Zeus and Hercules, is there talk? Are you hopeful? Oh, nobody's brought anything up with me, but uh, I mean, it seems like that's the idea at the end of the last one, right? Um, but but I, I don't really know. Yeah, I, look, you know, any if you're a young actor and you get the opportunity to be on a set with Taika Waititi, just yeah. take it. It's a lot of fun. You know, he's a creative genius, but he's also just a lovely bloke. And I also, you know. Um, I didn't know Chris um, Hemsworth very well at all, yeah. you know, before uh, working with him. And, you know, I was really um, uh, pleasantly surprised at what a good actor he is, you know, and oh. he's got great comedy chops, man. He's just funny, you know what I mean? So, and, and he's a really warm, welcoming fella. So um, we just went to town with that. I mean, you know, what you see when you're at the movie theater is this big, sumptuous, amazing, you know, uh, set but in reality it's just me and chris and a couple of cardboard boxes covered in blue shit you know <laughs> <laughs> just fucking around having a good time right yeah, yeah. why yeah. not yeah so um the one other project i did want to mention that's coming up um on the flip side a much different kind of vibe i would imagine i'm a big jc chandor fan and you got a yeah. chance to work with him for this craven yeah. film um from what i g gather pretty grounded practical sets did you enjoy the the Craven experience? What can I expect? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I got on with JC very, very well, you know, um, and we sort of like, you know, dined together a few times off set and everything. And I, I, it's pretty easy to say we're mates, you know. Um, so I really, I, I really in, enjoyed, you know, working on that for him, playing a Russian, you know. Um, that was a challenge. I did it once. I did a Russian accent once on Saturday Night Live, and it's probably the worst Russian accent ever done on television because um, <laughs> I didn't really, you know, I didn't really think about it that much. I just jumped off the cliff. But, um, yeah, I don't really know what to expect in that that movie, you know. I, I, yeah. Mine is not a hugely significant role in that film, I wouldn't uh, think. It, a significant role in the background of the main characters, but not necessarily in the feature film. This film, Pope's Exorcist, I, I think is smart in the way it's it's obviously a self-contained story. It leaves you just enough that's like, oh, wait, we could go on another little, we could go on another adventure. We could see where this goes next. And I feel like you have to thread that needle sometimes with films. And some some films sometimes lay down the groundwork and get, they jump the, they jump ahead a little bit too quickly. Like, hey, we're doing four four more movies right away. Um right. It, it, it was that important to you to be like, yeah, this is a character I enjoy. Let's tease the audience, but let's not get ahead of ourselves at the end? Or, or how, how do you thread yeah, that needle? Well, as, you, as you probably know, every single time anybody on a film production says, we're thinking we might be able to make, you know, three or four of these, you know, you know, that's <laughs> it. Not going to have a sequel. That's it. Yeah. Done. Yeah. As soon as you sort of say it out loud, it's like you just put the kibosh on it, you know. Um, but, you know, the central premise which I think is kind of clever, you know, because it's a biblical premise, you know, that there's 200 fallen angels, you know, and it says in the Bible that they were cast to earth and they were driven underground, you know? So the, the central premise that there's 200 physical places across the planet where That's God right. is not welcome or where evil source is from, it's a pretty cool idea, you know? And you ready for have, 199 more of these? You have 199 well, more? That's, that's the joke that we had on the set, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you in episode 124. Um, <laughs> you know, but who's, who knows? It, it really is going to be up to an audience response. If the audience jumps on this and they really yeah. like the adventure and they want to see it happen again. And the thing is, you know, there's little bits and pieces that I brought to the character, one of which was choosing his mode of transport as being – an old Lambretta scooter, you know, and there's been a couple of times where they put images of a priest on a motor scooter 
out on social media and the response is gigantic. You know what I mean? Who knew? People want to see a priest on a motor scooter. Who knew? <laughs> tapped into something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you have another movie musical in you? I mean, Les Mis must have been a moment for you, considering your love of, of music, your love of film, and marrying it together I, in I an iconic that set, man. There was nothing, there's no more joyful set that I've ever been on than, than Les Mis. Just the fundamental thing of all of us living inside that music and singing constantly together and just the joy of that. It kind of like, it kind of transported me back to my theater days in a way, you know, where, uh, you know, you, you're sort of in a, a big cast and everybody's, you know, um, working on that same thing and music is, is part of your, your daily routine. And and so that was lovely. And, and it, it really forged a, a forever deep friendship with me and Hugh, with me and Anne, with me and Amanda, with me and Samantha Barks, Eddie Redman, all of these guys. It's, it's kind of like one of those things where, you know, you might not see each other regularly, but when you do, that connection is very, very deep, you know, because we also got to share things like singing together at the Academy Awards, you know. I mean, come on, that's... But here's the thing about that. Right. Yeah. Here's the thing about that, Josh. We'd never done that. We didn't do the musical. We did the film, right? So that opening sequence of the movie, you know, or, or that song, right, is shot in nine, ten different places. Of course. There yeah. were not any two individuals that sing in that song that sang in the same geographical proximity, right? Yeah. And so Cameron McIntosh gets the offer from the, the Academy Awards. Yeah, hey, can the cast come and sing a song? He goes, great. We'll do it. Right, because he's thinking <laughs> theatrically, you know, and Easy. this is yeah. th this yeah. is different, right? Yeah. And so it came back to all the individuals, and we we're like, we've never Sorry? sung that song together. <laughs> we've never done that, and they're like, oh shit! So then they had to organize this rehearsal time, right? So I think we rehearsed at Capitol Records, and that there's tape uh, on YouTube of you guys rehearsing together. I've, I've seen that. Yeah. It's like, and I yeah. yeah yeah, and then and then we did I think. Two run-throughs at the uh, Oscars. I'm not, I'm not sure which building we were in for, <laughs> but we did two run-throughs, and um, we never got it right. Didn't get it right. The only time we did it right together as a group was when we were live in front of two billion people. Yeah, you're probably you're not a guy that scares easily, I would imagine. But that I, that would scare the shit out of anyone, I think, just to. Well, to be in that that's element. why you do it, man. Yeah, this is yeah, why yeah. You, I do this job. It's the adrenaline hits. Yeah, you know, that's what keeps you coming back. It's like when you're facing something, you think, "Oh, this is impossible." You know, I've got to learn, you know, a foreign language, and I've got to, you know, do it in this particular uh, speed and under these circumstances or whatever. And and you know, then you do it, and it's done, and it's like cool. You know, you manage yeah. to do it, but it's that adrenaline hit that uh, is a really, you know, is is the thing that drives you in the job. I think, you know. Okay, I'm going to let you go on this. I promise uh, uh, you, Russell, you've been very generous with your time. Um, is there a sequel that's gotten away? Because, like, I'm greedy. I want the nice guys. I always right. wanted to – I've heard about the Nick Cave Gladiator script, which obviously sounded insane, but kind of amazing. Um, it's kind of amazing. You know, the thing is, we at the t time when I, I, I came up with that idea, and I, I was the one that brought uh, Nick into that process, and I was the one that paid him to do a draft – you know, um, it's so odd because at the time when we discussed it, um, everybody else that we were involved with that wanted to do a straight ahead thing. You know, no, he, you know, he gets injured, you know, in that thing, but he, they stick him in a cage, put on some freaking herbs, and three days later they open the cave and out he it's comes. It's a miracle. Like, <laughs> you can't get the rights to that book, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but, you know, the other side of that was, you know, this other idea that I had, well, okay, he's – He's killed too many people to go to heaven, right? But he's too good a man to be cast into hell. So you meet Maximus, right? And it's like you're in a refugee camp on the Somalian border, right? Yeah. You don't know where you are, right? But when you meet him and you, you realize that he's in limbo, he's stuck between worlds, you know? And the ideas that we had in order to get him back um, – to to earth and it was, it was all justifiable and cool and we we could have done it but you know these things require a whole bunch of people to be facing in the same direction you yeah. know and and i was very very busy so i didn't probably give it the the time at the time that that, that i should have um but it's odd because a couple of years later after the same people refusing that that was a cool idea then they remade that old film from the 50s with sam worthington which is a similar idea where all those you know the gods 
come yep. alive or whatever. Clash but, of the okay, Titans, yeah. yeah, sure. Yep. Clash of the Titans, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and look, in you know, there's a lot of characters that I've played that I'd be perfectly happy, you know, doing uh, another episode in their lives. Wouldn't you like to see, you know, Bud White – you know, oh. 60 years old, walking down the street of some small Arizona town and something happens and he's got to go back to Los Angeles, you know. Um, Elroy's <laughs> around. He can he can make that happen. Come on. We've lost but, Curtis, but, but James like 310 is around. To yeah. Yuma. Did you ever see that film, 310 Of course, to sir. Oh, my, are you kidding right. me? Of course. So yeah. we had this whole idea, you know, that, you know, Ben Wade then goes across the border to the Pueblo he's talking about and, and he lives there, you know, off his riches until – this one situation comes up where he has to pick up a gun again to defend his family, you know, and, um, and when he picks up a gun, as we know, uh, things get pretty absolute with Ben Wade, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, there's, you know, yeah. but that's part of that is the richness of the film in the first place, you know, and the types of directors, Curtis Hansen and James Mangold, the people yeah. like that, you know, they, they set up a story in such a cinematic way that there's so many, you know, moving parts to it that, that it could have a second uh, tale or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, I have to admit, I'm slightly jealous um, to the people who get to work with Ridley on the next Gladiator because you know in the intervening years he's been thinking, in the last 24 years, he's been thinking, oh, I could have made that better, I could have made that better. And <laughs> they're giving him a, a huge budget. He's one of wow. the greatest filmmakers to ever be in the business. He's like working for Titian or something. He's like it's gigantic artist. And they all go and get to have that experience that I had when I was a much younger man. So, you know, pure human simplicity, you know, a little tingy jealous. Hey, he's he makes three movies a year. You'll you'll work with him again, don't you worry. That can't I can't be stopped. Well it's been a long time though, man. It's yeah. been Yeah, since Robin Hood, I guess probably, right? Since yeah. We made, 14 yeah. years since we made Robin Hood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, man. This is really, honestly, a true treat. We just scratched the surface in an amazing uh, career. Hopefully, we'll have more conversations like this. Congratulations on the new film. I uh, hope to see you in person if you come by the States sometime. And uh, and thanks again, man. This has been an honor, truly. Cheers, man. My pleasure. Look after yourself. All right. Have a good one. Thanks again. Bye-bye.